For we shall make my princess you has been entertaining audiences with a unique Joey style Coco Diaz has of been rocking humor since the 90s, for 15 right? years. With her tongue in cheek, films and she's been exploring such topics as the dynamics of the male-female relationships, or as we past, call them here in the studio, dirty thoughts, that will make and the proliferation a different of the sensual feminist. She's a little firecracker rolled up, and that's why I love her, and that's why you're going to love listening. So tune in, all right? Greetings to all you beautiful podcasters out there in Podcastville. We're back. Beauty and the Beast podcast coming at you from all angles. Whether you're in Australia, UK, British Columbia, Vancouver, Africa, we got you. And we don't have your back, we got your spine, bitch. <laughs> I'm saying that's how we're rolling here on Beauty and the Beast. Say hello to these beautiful animals, Felicia. Hello, beautiful people. How are you? What's going on? Another fun-filled week here at the podcast studios. Felicia Michaels still killing numbers-wise, email-wise. I know. People love you, Joey Diaz. People love you, too. No, people love you. People want to fuck you. I got an email yesterday. People tolerate me. No, they want to tie you up and do nasty things to you. They love you. Felicia, this is a podcast. We're doing this together. Trust me, I'm telling you. You know what I'm saying? Every week we just tell fucking different stories and get to people in whatever way we can. Some are funny, some are not. I got a lot of emails on the thing I dropped last week about my mom. Yeah. Uh, I thought I had told the story before on MySpace, but like I said on MySpace last week, that every year, you know, after a death of somebody, you uh, you get to see it from a different angle every year more and more. And during the break, you know, I never wanted to come off like a, a mama's boy. I never, and I really am. We all are to an extent. We all are mama's boys to an extent. And even Felicia, your big things in your life are your mom. You I'm know? a mama's boy. And you learned a lot from yeah. your dad, but your mom has always been yeah, there. It's so weird. We were boy. talking about uh, music. Like, and you asked me what kind of music. Like, I even put my mom's name. My mom's name was Denora Valdez. That was her real fucking name. No alias is there. And it was so weird that I put R.I.P. and all this shit. And one of my friends asked me, because I never knew that was your mom's name after all those years. But you asked me what kind of music she liked. And I, my mom listened to everything. That's where I got the love for music. My mom would listen to rumba music and Cuban ballads, and then she would put on Jimmy Jim Morrison, The Doors. And I still remember her listening to Led Zeppelin, a whole lot of love, going, what the fuck? You know, but all that thing. And he's moaning and groaning. Uh, uh. My mom's like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? You know what I'm saying? Like, she couldn't understand it. But one of our favorite songs that till this day, every Monday morning, I get up and I play it. That's how I oh, know you it. Do? Yeah, every Monday morning. Because Monday morning is really the day of the spirit. You know, so when you wake up Monday mornings, you usually think about the people you lost. You know, sometimes you light a candle. Sometimes you're just thinking about them is good enough. And you play whatever. And every week I think about somebody else who died who I got strength from. Because that's all somebody dying is, is strength. You learn what their message is and what, where they fell short in telling that message. And what you're going to do different and telling your message. That's all you really get from somebody dying. When somebody dies and you're sitting there at the wake and you're looking at them, you're reflecting on their life. You're thinking about what they did, you know, and how they affected your life and why you're sitting there. You know, when I lived in Jersey, you went to a wake every other fucking week just because it's somebody's friend of yours. Their uncle died, their mom or their right. cousin. And you're at this wake and you don't even know this person. You're just playing respect. Uh, to that person who died. Oh, exactly. But sometimes oh, people to your die. Friends, to your yeah, friends. and they fucking yeah. touch you. And uh, my mother's death, like any other uh, parent's death, would always touch you, whether it's a dad or a grandparent. But you were asking me about music. When we would go to the bar, she would have, uh, we would get in, she'd open up the door, turn the alarm off, and then turn the light on and look around. And we had the front bar, then we had the back where the pool table was, where they did all their fucking things. <clears throat> the first song she would play always was I Want to Be Around by Tony Bennett. which is a fucking jam. Forget about He Left Your uh, Heart in San Francisco. If you listen to Want to Be Around, and what the song is, is really I want to be around to watch you become whoever the fuck you're going to become. I want to be there for you. And I remember she was playing it as a, as a kid. I hated that fucking song. <laughs> I want to be around again, you know? And and it was at the house. The album was at the house. And oh, we, yeah, she and was had, serious yeah, about it. Yeah, she was it. serious about it. <laughs> And, and again, the day she died was when I understood that song. And yeah. I didn't hear it for years. And then I heard it out one night. And to me, that, was, that meant that my mother was close by to hear oh, that song out. Nice. Yeah. You know, you hear it out at a restaurant yeah. or something. You're like, holy fuck. I ordered a long brow and did a bump out of respect. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Let me do a bump now. This means I got to do the coke now. I can't wait till after dinner. 
But it's so weird how my mom used to put uh, lipstick on her quarters, red flaming lipstick. Uh-huh. So when the, 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 the collections guy from the jukebox came, those were her quarters. They were also on the pool table, and they were also in the, in the bowling machine. We had an old school bowling machine that you put sawdust on. And, right. And I would stand on top of that. That was my first stage. Oh, really? That little fucking really? bowling machine was always my first stage. That's where I would go up and get people's attention that I was going to perform in two minutes and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You say, I'm going to perform in two minutes, cocksucker. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't curse then. I would goof on everybody at the bar. Yeah. I would say, sit down or whatever. But it's so weird how you think back about your memories with your parents and what made you. Because that bar made me who the fuck I was. But back to the quarters, I remember years later, even after my mom died, going and buying stuff in Union City and getting those quarters back for change. Oh, really? Like giving somebody a dollar and getting those quarters back for wow. change. And knowing that was my mom's quarter at one time. November's always been a, a wild month for me because my mother died in November. Oh, really? I went to prison in November. I did the worst crime of my life in November. I got inducted into Santeria in November. But something I didn't want to wow. tell you before today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of wow. shit in November, you know? So <laughs> Why like, do you always tell me that when we're in November? <laughs> because it's weird. For me, November's like New Year's. Right. Because you judge your year by what happens in oh, November. Really? I always oh, say, wow. like, like Marilyn died November 3rd. You know, I stopped really officially doing coke like November 7th. But the wow. weird thing that happened in November that I didn't want to tell you this morning was that for the last six months I've been smoking cigarettes at night. Uh-huh. I quit smoking cigarettes for five years. And last February I was shooting a movie and I started smoking again. Like at night, you know, and I would smoke two or three and then six or seven. And last weekend in Austin it was just too many. I must have smoked 100 cigarettes. Oh, really? So when, I mean, Sunday morning when I got up, I'm like, I'm not smoking again for a fucking couple of weeks. But it's hard to do the podcast and not smoke a few cigarettes because they loosen me up. Right. You know, and somebody else. No, uh, I know. I smoke a cigarette. I yeah, don't even you smoke. Loosen up. But you if loosen you take up. a yeah. cigarette out, I'm like, okay. I'll have yeah, a you smoke it and you yeah. loosen up. As a, right. And it's weird because my acupuncture says that when you smoke sometimes it makes you creative. And in my case, it really is. It makes puts a different zing to me. Right. And it's weird that I used to fucking the smoke. The cigarettes, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> I used to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day really? without doing blow. Oh, really? Like, I would start smoking. Like, I would smoke a pack before I left the house. And I would only smoke half cigarettes. And I smoke like a like a freight train because I get into the energy of it. Right. And then I realized, well, I don't even need all these cigarettes. My, like, I can go for weeks without smoking a cigarette. But when I have one, I'll smoke a bunch of them. And how I quit smoking. Somebody said to me, how did you quit smoking the first time? And I was like, how did I quit smoking? Do you know how I quit smoking cigarettes the first time, Felicia? How? By doing coke. <laughs> listen to me, Doug. Isn't I had, that how you quit heroin, listen, too? Listen, I had Isn't this that? idea. I had this idea that I had this idea. Anybody who's done coke knows that once you do a couple lines and you yeah. smoke, it makes you a triple threat smoker. You really start smoking cigarettes. Like To have, do coke without cigarettes oh, yeah. is a nightmare. So I had this plan in mind. <laughs> I had this fucking plan. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit smoking cigarettes. I'm done because I wanted to get in shape and change my life together. I couldn't figure out how I would do it. So I know it's a psychological block. I know that when you get on a plane, you want a cigarette as soon as they close the door. And it's just right. your mind playing tricks on you. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so I'm sitting on this fucking... I go, I know what I, exactly what I'll do. I'll come home one night, get a gram of Coke, do uh-huh. it, and won't smoke cigarettes. I won't bring home cigarettes with me. And I know that if I'll be too paranoid to get up and go to 7-Eleven because that's just oh, not... Yeah. <laughs> I know I'll be too paranoid, so right. I have to sit there for five hours doing coke without a cigarette. And I actually, one night, I, I went home, and I took a <laughs> gram and a half of the best coke I could get. Not even a gram. I took a gram and a half, and I went home. I did the whole fucking gram and a half in one line, and I sat there sweating for five hours because I wanted <laughs> a cigarette. And I did everything I could not to have a cigarette. I tried everything. But you know what? When I woke up the next morning, I knew I had arrived. <laughs> yes, I'm <laughs> sure. That, if I could I'm do sure. coke for five hours... <laughs> And not want a cigarette. That's mental powers. And I never smoked a cigarette again for five years. So thanks to cocaine that night, I never smoked a cigarette. Because you showed me my mental strength. You understand me? Sometimes you got to do something bad to get something good out of it. Right. So I did a gram and a half, but I stopped smoking cigarettes for five years. So always think of, because the hardest thing to me was smoking a joint yeah. and then not following it right. with a cigarette. That's tough. But when I went for it, like I, sm- I, st- I quit smoking on a Monday first. And that whole Monday, I smoked dope without a cigarette. And I, it was eating me alive. So I knew that the only thing that would bust me, if I didn't need it for weed, the only thing that would bust me was when I did coke. And you know what? Thinking about it in hindsight, the last two years without cigarettes and coke, it just wasn't the same. Just doing coke and a glass of water and jerking off just ain't the same without the cigarette. So maybe that all contributed to me not getting high. You follow me? 
So if you're thinking about smoking pot at home, yeah. uh, thinking of quitting smoking cigarettes, yeah. you know, narrow it down to the yeah. fucking what makes you strong. Fuck the patch, do a bump. Fuck the patch, <laughs> get a gram do of a blow bump. and sit there sweating. Let me tell you something. Yeah. At four in the morning after you haven't had a cigarette for five right. hours and you're sweating and you can't oh jerk off because you can't focus and you're sitting there going, I need a cigarette to jerk off so this whole thing, the ADD <laughs> can just get into one big zone. And the next morning I woke up, I'm like, fuck, I didn't smoke a cigarette during that coke hail storm. I don't need a cigarette ever again. And you know what? It really did work. So whatever. <laughs> whatever works for you, works for you. Please call a professional if you have a drug problem. <laughs> Fuck a professional. That's the All problem with America is. Everybody wants to call a professional. You know who the professional is when you're trying to change yeah, your life? I'm sitting across no, from him right here. The professional is you. That's who the professional is because we know what we can do and what we can't do. Come on, guys. You know that you could go without a cigarette or a piece of ass for three weeks. All of a sudden, you get in a position, you're like, oh, my God, I haven't done a bump. In a we can live without this shit. The only professional when you're trying to get your life together is you. Think about that because you know what you can and what you can't do. But you have to give it a try. Right. You know what, Felicia? It's really weird that the last two or three weeks our podcast has been very good numbers wise. Yes. And let yes, me tell you something. Been. When I approached you uh -huh. and I said to you, I, I think it would be a great idea because of our voices. Right. I, I, in my heart, I was like, you know what? I think this is a great idea. I think we're both honest people. We both come from the same cut. And all those ideas were right. We, we, they came into oh, fruition. Absolutely. But you know what? In this town, as Felicia knows, people would have given up already. Some people would have said, ah, I'm not getting nothing from it. You know what, Felicia? We stuck around. The miracle happened. The miracle happened. I never even dreamed of iPod 200, iTunes. I don't know nothing about that. I just wanted to put out something people could take home with them, listen to it, and let them affect them in a different way. And look, all of a sudden the numbers are there. And people calling us to sponsor us and this and that. And it was because we stuck around till the miracle happened. Right. You know? Yeah. No, this, you know what I really love about the podcast is the fact that we didn't overthink it. It's just like, hey, let's do this thing. And let's just figure it out and let's just not overthink it and see what happens. And sometimes in life you have to do that. You just have to you just have to do something. You you know, like I, I said before, like I always think about the force, but sometimes you just gotta do the day to day, you know, get up and fucking do it. And right now I'm thinking about sushi. I love to have a fucking piece of sushi today. <laughs> but I don't have the money today, you know what I'm saying? But I'll make the best right. of it. And, and and it's so weird how you go without things sometimes and you, you want things or you, you wanna smoke a cigarette, you wanna do a bump or you wanna go out and party. And people don't realize that we control all that shit. Yeah. You know, I know I can't have the sushi. I'm mean, going to go to a tuna fish sandwich with a tomato. That's because American sushi is just as don't, good as that shit. Don't make me start crying. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going to make you start crying. But no, I And, see and this is what the podcast is about. It's about, uh, I know that people need one thing in their life that we don't pay for, and that's laughter. You can't pay for laughter oh, sometimes. You, I love to laugh, guys. Me don't too. think, I but fucking like, love coming here. You know, when you go through all this shit, like laughing at it, like sometimes I feel bad when you tell me a story and it's like the, the I'm sorry to say, the burning the wig, where I laugh because it was funny how you told it, but you, you know, sometimes you just got to laugh at the darkest shit. And know? that make, makes your life easier. And I know that we all have one thing in common. It's not bills and it's not herpes. We all have one thing. We got we got fucking pain. Speaking of, yeah, uh, you made me I look at your. Yeah, I broke my pants. Right, my <laughs> pants broke, so I didn't wear underwear because I don't like wearing underwear with these jeans. And today I went to pet this little cat on my block named Chocho, who's adorable. And Her I name's went, Chocho. Yeah, Pussy? Oh, she's beautiful. She's Pussy, fucking beautiful. Right? Chocho, not Chocha. Oh, okay. Chocho, he's a two, <laughs> he's like, a two two man. That's genius. <laughs> so I went to pet her today, and every time I pet her, my my thing breaks. Now the turtle neck's out. It now it's out. perfect. Like you wanna I, see it? I you wanna see it? About no, you just already. Just take a look me. at the tip. No, just take a look at the. No, just take a look at no. the. Just take a look. Jesus just look at the tail. Christ, <laughs> you rinse some rice off in that thing. I put a little turtle neck out, but it's weird. For years, I would always have a little cut there, and I would always take a ball sack out when I was having conversation with people, just to see how long it would take them to say, "Joey, do you know you're ripping your pants?" And people oh. say it to me seriously. Like, Joey, you're ripping your pants. I know that. That's why I have them like that. I wanted you to see my nuts. like, God, it's about time they noticed. But these little holes sometimes create big holes. Like one time I went in for an episode of How I Met Your Mother, and I had a little hole in my pants just like these. And as I went to sit in the chair, the chair thing caught the jean and went quack. And, all, and it was three women in the producer's session. They looked at me, and I go, excuse me, did you see the Cuban egg roll? And they fell the fuck out. They fell out. One of the chicks was Cuban, so she loved right. it. She started giggling. Oh, I'm sorry about the Cuban egg roll. Well, I'm in there 20 <laughs> minutes with these three chicks, and I walk out. And as I'm walking out of Fox, I get a call from my agent. She goes, go back in there. You were in there for like 30 minutes, and you forgot to read. 
Oh, like yeah. we had them from the ball rip and why I don't wear underwears in 90 degree weather. And they still gave me the role. Then they cut me on television. If you see the episode, I'm sitting there like a fucking mutt. But I rocked them so much with the Cuban right. egg roll. And sometimes I just want to rock you this morning. Okay, I was like, I how know. long like, would it take for me? I want to see how well, long here, it would take you to see them. Like when we were hanging out on the, on the couch in the little studio, it was all fine. But then we go outside for you to smoke a cigarette. And, uh, and it's like, you know, high noon. And, and it's like, and the ball sack came right out. And only one nut, because both nuts won't fit out of this little hole. Yeah. So just as when one nut sack falls out, it's like when you have uh, undies on, those undies you wore in the third grade, and you wear them now, because I wear those too, those cotton, cotton whiteies. And every once in a while, my balls are 40 year old balls. They One pops out. It don't have enough comfort for two. You know what I'm saying? That's what Marino don't talk about in the fucking commercial. That both your nuts won't stay in this goddamn thing. Always one falls out. In fact, I think I got like three nuts lately. I've been. Because when you, you, you grow an extra one during winter, yeah, or like you get like five. I got one that's a tip that holds the other one down. It's like a bag of loot that they pull out of the ocean. It's like watching the deadliest catch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Enjoy your ball, sir. No matter how old you get. How do we fucking do this on the podcast? Oh, no. Last week we did a whole thing about blowjobs when I was listening to it. My skin was crawling. When I was editing the podcast, last oh, week, I'm I was like, like, what is this, this shit? This whole, thank God you 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 know how to. A deep moment because uh, all we did was talk about blowjobs. No, you need a deep moment because we all have deep yeah. moments in our lives. And I got a lot of people saying, hey, man, that was deep. Or I thought about my mom. Or I thought, I just want people to think when they listen to the podcast. Oh, I'm not here with fake fucking shit talking about this and that shit I don't care about. When I come right. talk to you people, it's about something we're all going to care about, you know? Right. My nutsack. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like something like that. <laughs> Fuck the patch. Do a bump. <laughs> hey, listen, you want to quit smoking? You got to be creative. It worked for five fucking years, Felicia. You laugh. I sat there for five hours sweating with a heart on on, trying to think how I could walk the 7-Eleven, because I would never drive coked up. Yeah. So I was thinking how I could walk the 7-Eleven, and it was only two blocks away. And I, and I knew I would be too paranoid to leave the fucking oh, house. no, that must have been terrible. That's the worst feeling, to have to walk to 7-Eleven. Oh, and look at the fucking Hindu, and he look you in the eye. And, <laughs> and you're sitting there, and you know you've been up, and then you walk out of there, and some guy wants to ask you 50 cents. And you're like, I ain't got 50 cents. And he's like, yeah, you got enough to do that blow. <laughs> How did you know, homeless man? <laughs> Right. I think I gave you a left hook and you said, fuck it, I don't yes, need this shit. Yes, yes. Uh, the second time he gave me the right, left the hook. Right, the last second time. And uh, so then uh, I haven't really spoken to him or seen him in 25 years. You just abandoned ship. One he, day. Uh, yeah, I was like, bye, have a nice day. You were at like work. Springsteen. You got a pack of cigarettes Hello, and never you came ball. back. That's right. That's it. That's right. And uh, so he sent me an email through Facebook and it was rather long and uh, kind of rambly and. Uh, and he's going through a lot right now. And I was just so surprised to get it, Joey. It was just such a trip. And in the email, it, it made me feel kind of sad because uh, in the email, he he was like, I'm so sorry that, uh, you know, I did that to you. And, uh, you know, I apologize. And you probably hate my guts and, and all this kind of stuff. And honestly, like, this is what I feel bad about. I haven't really thought about him that much. I don't think bad things about him, you know, because, you know, I was, I think I just turned 18 and he was maybe 19, 20. We were kids, you know what I mean? And and, uh, the story is what happened was this. When I was uh, 17, I graduated high school, barely. And uh, uh, I lived with my mom and my mom had had a stroke and <clears throat> and was on uh, in a Denver at a rehabilitation center for like a year. So I was on my own for a year, dodging the social workers. I would hide under the bed when they would come to the door. And uh, I basically had a situation that was somewhat similar to yours, not uh, as uh, street uh, uh, crazy as yours, but where I slept on a lot of couches at a lot of people's houses. There was pain. It was a lot of pain, yeah. It was and, pain. And I, like one of my, I had two best friends. Their name uh, were Tammy and Sarah. And they had a father. You know, I grew up in a town of Fountain, Colorado, which is about 25 miles south of Colorado Springs in between Colorado and Pueblo. I like to call Fountain the taint of Colorado. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so there was no jobs there. And, uh, and it was, it's a lot of army uh, families and a lot of uh, there's quite a bit of poverty. 
<clears throat> and so uh, I lived there with my mother, and uh, and I stayed a lot at Tammy and Sarah's house, who had a father who was a master sergeant in the army, and he was an alcoholic, and he was a very nice man. He would let me sleep on his couch and uh, eat his food without ever saying anything, but he had a lot of problems, and Tammy and Sarah, quite frankly, had a lot of problems. And so uh, when my mom got back out of the rehabilitation center, she was gone for almost a year, it was really difficult because she needed uh, a lot of physical help, uh, me helping her just exist day to day, you know, because she was paralyzed, and and uh, and I was on my own, so I, you know, didn't take take it good, you know what I mean? I, I had been, a, you know, imagine, you know, being on your own for a year when you're 15, and then the parent comes back, and the parent has no physical way to restrain you, but wants you to go back to when you were 13, 14. It's, it's just not going to happen. It's tough. And, uh, and, uh, and, and quite frankly, when you're with someone who becomes an invalid or who becomes handicapped, uh, it's, it's really hard for them to see past their own illness or their own handicap to what other people are going through. And I had a lot of guilt about this for my mother for a long time, you know. And uh, so my aunt had come to visit us. My aunt um, uh, was, uh, lived in Germany, and she gave me as a graduation present a plane ticket to go to Germany. Uh, right before I went to go on my trip, I met this guy, Jeff, through my friends, Tammy and Sarah, who dated all the guys at Fort Carson. And uh, and we went out for about three months, and he you know, was a nice guy, and he had his stuff together as far as being an army guy, and it was all good, but uh, I didn't think it was that serious. And then I went on my trip, and when I was over in Germany, I uh, lived with my aunt for a little while, and then uh, uh, for about four or five months, I went to Italy, uh, and very fortunate. I knew I was very fortunate to have this uh, opportunity, and I worked for my cousin, who was a little bit older in a business, and they basically wanted me to say goodbye to my mother, write her off, her own family, write her off, and come and learn a trade. And it was uh, an opportunity that was uh, tremendous because I was all of a sudden having a great lifestyle, but I couldn't do it for the expense of my mother. You know what I mean? I felt a lot of guilt towards that. And during this period, Jeff, the guy that I had dated, had uh, gotten into a really bad car accident and uh, in, killed two people in the other car. He was drunk. You know, he was 19 years old, partying. And his younger brother, who was 16, was in the car, uh, re, uh, got serious brain damage, still to this day, serious brain damage. There was a girl in the car, an old girlfriend, and she, uh, uh, like, really fucked up her leg and had to walk with a cane, I think, for the rest of her life. And Jeff was really messed up, and he was announced DOA when the ambulance came, and he survived. Uh, but then he started writing me letters when I was in Italy. And the letters were like, I wouldn't have been able to survive this without thinking about you. You know, I'm really in love with you. You should come back. We should be together. And he was in the hospital for like three or four months. So then I was like, you know what? I can't leave my mom by herself in the middle of fucking Colorado in this town with no family. She's handicapped. Like, I got to do the right thing and go back and be with my mom. And my mom was on welfare. We lived on in, ho in government housing. And when I went back... Uh, my mom had gotten a little bit better, but there we didn't have a car. I'm in a town of 7,000 people. The three jobs that are possible, there's, you know, 2,500 applications right, going in. Right, yes. You know, there was no bus to go there. And, uh, and, I, ha and I couldn't live with my mother because I turned 18. And at that time, I don't know if it's changed, if you're on government housing, if there's a child in the house that turns 18 and doesn't go to college, uh, then, the go you know, th they got to get out. Like Precious. Yes, you got to right. get out. You got to get the fuck out. So I <clears throat> didn't know what to do. And at that time, uh, Jeff came and picked me up when I arrived in uh, Colorado off the plane. And he had changed so much physically. He had lost like 40 pounds. I walked right by him. I didn't even recognize him because he got really jacked up in that accident. And he was had just learned how to walk like the week before. He was really messed up. <clears throat> so he asked me to marry him. And... Uh, and I did because I just thought, there's no, what else can I do? I'm now stuck again in this town. I don't have a car. I can't get a job. All my girlfriends were marrying GIs. That's what you did. You got married when you're 18. That's why it makes me so fucking mad when I see women in L.A. or New York or in metropolitan cities making fun of women like, why, did they, why don't they go to school? Why don't they get a job? Why don't they do this? You know what? Not everybody has the same fucking opportunities that you have. And for some people, that's, that's how they get out. 
You know what I mean? You get married when you're 18 because that's what you're taught to do. That's how it is in the general population, not your fucking fancy pants life that you've led in going to private school and having opportunities and parents that sat there at the table with you doing homework. That's not everyone's life, you know? And, uh, and then when I was married uh, to Jeff, you know, he, he was fucked up. You know what I mean? He, he killed two people in a terrible accident. He jacked his brother up in this accident. He had brain damage a little bit himself. I mean, he was fucked up. And so uh, there were twice. One time he struck me because the car broke down. And I mean, a uh, full punch to the face. And the next time, it was in the kitchen, and he came after me. Over How the long dishes. were you with him before he hit you? Just about six months. And there was no, I didn't see, Nothing there was coming. never cunt, any, a punch to the head, no. there was, it was like, you know, he Bam. just came out yeah. after me. And look, even at that time, I understood here's a person that has a lot of problems, but when someone comes after you and you see the look in their eye of how That's angry, scary. they're not angry at you. They're just angry, you know? And uh, when I got this email today, it really, uh, yesterday, it made me sad because he's carried around a lot of guilt with him and it's really affected his life still to this day and Where did you hear that? um uh it didn't say on the email because it came through my facebook and i actually didn't look at his information because i was so stunned by it but uh and i thought well I, maybe i should talk about it today because you know uh i i just don't have any anger towards him i feel bad for him and, and I feel, you know, it's so strange to me how you can, at a young time in your life, and when you're around certain people, and you know, I'm going to shed this person. You know what I mean? You shed people. Sometimes you shed people. Sometimes you're the one that gets shed. Absolutely. Because people are moving on. They're it's moving not that on. they're better. It's not that they're worse. It's just they have a different path, you know? And I just thought you know i felt bad for him because he that really affected him for the rest of his life me leaving more than the violence he put on me affected me because i just knew when the second time it happened like the first time it happened i was like i'm fucking out of here fuck that shit but i stayed you know because oh, maybe he's never gonna do it but the second time it happens like he's always gonna do this because he's done it now twice and this is not my journey my my path is a different direction. You were very smart to see that at that age. Thank God. Thank well, God you've seen that. A lot of people don't see it and take that guilt because he got into a car accident and killed two people, so I might as well stay and share this fucking miserable life with this prick. I mean... Well, that's the thing that's interesting to me because sometimes you get yourself into a clusterfuck because you feel so guilty that you're a little bit of a shinier light bulb than the people you're around. And you're like, I gotta stay because... You know, it's it's guilt. I gotta stay, and that's the worst reason to stay for anything. I mean, when you leave, you gotta do it correctly, and maybe I didn't do that uh, correctly enough because I literally was after the the day that he came after me the second time. Uh, he apologized. The next morning, he got up and went to work, and I was like, "Okay, I'll make your favorite thing." And I literally, when he got in the car, packed my shit and left. But I didn't know how else to do it. So I mean, that was painful for him, but, uh, and then I saw him again when I was about 21, 22, and I was stripping out here in LA, and he got in contact with me, and he was kind of going through a rough patch, and he wanted maybe to get back together with me, but I was like, no, dude, my, my journey is different than your journey, you know, and I gave him a ride somewhere, and gave him, you know, and he was like, you gotta go, and, uh, and I don't have any hard feelings towards him. So sometimes if you go through something earlier in life where you have a lot of guilt, like I have a lot of guilt about my mom because that, you know, I, I don't feel I handled my mom's situation as best that I could have, but I was also very young and I didn't have any other choices. But I, I think, you know, when you do something shitty in your life when you're younger, you know, that sometimes the people you think are harboring all this ill will, honestly, maybe are not. You know? One thing you said that was very interesting that I've had, always had fucking doubts with. You said that when you got the email, what bothered you was that it didn't really bother you like you thought it would over the years. And I suffer from the same thing. When when uh, I got divorced, I got married at an early age, out of prison. You know, I came out and she had been there. But the truth was, we were going to break up a week before I committed that crime. There was nothing there. Right. You know, we were from two different paths and. Uh, 
right away I went away and she felt committed to me because I had bailed her out earlier. And, uh, you know, we got divorced. And I got to tell you, I'll never forget her leaving. It didn't affect me. Like, I thought I was numb for years after that. It fucked with me because it didn't affect me how I thought it would affect me. And then years later, I realized that divorce affects you in a weird way, especially if there's a child involved. But even till this day, I don't hate my ex-wife. She's just somebody that exists. She's just somebody that exists in Colorado. I don't think about her, and it bothers me. It bothers me that I walked down the aisle with her and took one of the biggest commitments of my life with her. Like, even 20 years later, I should be able to say, wow, that was a great day. No, it wasn't. It was a fucking horror show of a day. And basically all it was was two people f doing what they thought they should be doing at this part of their life, which for a lot of viewers or listeners, think about what I'm saying. You know, you come out of high school, and right away you go to college. Ah, bad move, because you don't even know what the fuck you want. You've just been around two people who are telling you for the last 30 years that you should be an accountant or an attorney or this and this. Now you sign up for fucking school. And your third grade, your third semester in, your third year in, you realize you don't even like doing this shit. You just did this because of your family. There is where the pain starts. Right. That is where the fucking pain starts. You don't even realize it. You don't even realize. You just want to be a goody two-shoes. Your grandfather left you money and wanted you to be some fucking whatever the fuck he is. And now there it is. Then you get out of jail. Or you get out of, sorry, you get out of, of college, same difference. And you meet this fucking girl who was kind of cool and kind of pretty. And it's because society tells you you should have kids. You have kids and marry her. And now, 10 years later, you're stuck with this lady who you really don't even love. You don't even know. You just married her because you were in a frat and she was a sorority. And that's what fucking momos do. And you got to maintain the smile. So that's when the pills start and the drinking starts and all the cheating starts and all the shit that goes on with it. If it was just numbed at the fucking college level. But we don't know that because we're too young. Right. And then we're supposed to not know when to make a mistake or not know. But society points you at things sometimes. Your mistake wasn't your mistake. It was a society mistake. At that piece of the world, in that society where you lived. Right. That's what a broad did. You get, you get to be 19, you met fucking Popeye the Sailor, and you got married, you spit some kids out on the government fucking GI Bill, and that's it. You evolved. There was no really evolution. You didn't even become your mother. You became somebody else or something. It's so weird what society wants from you. But the really thing that's crazy is how you and I didn't get stunned by that. I don't think about my ex-wife. And I get mad at her for some of the things with my daughter, but I got to be honest with you, not really. Right. It was like it was another life ago. Yeah. It was another life ago. And, uh, well, I totally agree with what you're saying. Look, uh, so, you know, everyone's different. And society and uh, wants everything to be black and white when the truth is there's so much gray. You know what? Uh, most kids should go to college. You know, most kids are too No, 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 immature. I'm not saying yeah, not that, to go to college. Right, I'm saying to go. go out and get a job for two years. Right. And see what the real world is about. Because in today's society, college does nothing for you for your college anymore. That's just like an extension to high school. You got to specialize in something and get this and international law, all this, to really make a difference out of college. You don't fucking know what you want. I want to be an optometrist because right. they have glasses and you know, in your third year, you're fucking around with eyeballs. This ain't what you really wanted to do. Right. You were just stupid. You read a book when you were 16. Your, your girlfriend's parents steered you in that direction. I mean, it happens. Yeah. Everybody should go to college. I'm not saying that they shouldn't. What I'm trying to say that people should do is do what the fuck they want to do with their heart. Sometimes society makes us do certain things. Right. And we're numb to them. Look at you and I. I mean, here's two people out of a million that I don't give a fuck out of my first <laughs> wedding. I wouldn't give a fuck. As I was packing the stuff when I got divorced, I remember those pictures in the first wedding. I never even took them. Yeah. I don't give a fuck about my first wedding. It, it, was, it was so long ago. 1990 was 3,000 years ago to a guy like right. me. Whether you know me personally, yeah. physically, and you too. You yeah, were two different people. Yeah. You just said it. I got married because I lost my mommy, and I thought that was the thing to do. My mom wanted a daughter, and this and this and this. And at the end of the fucking game, there was no mommy. You got to live your goddamn life. You ever see these guys, I joined the service because my papa was in the service. Right. And then they get in the service like the gentleman we had a couple weeks ago, and then they realize this is overwhelming. We don't want to fucking do this. The main thing about this podcast is being optimistic, but living out your fucking dream. Living out your dream. And, and sometimes by the way, people sometimes don't know it. You, you know what? That's, that's you a, don't know but it. But here's the other thing, Joey. Like, 
Uh, I, I have always known uh, that I'm going to lead a different kind of life than the people I was around, ever, ever, even when I was a little girl, like, you know, and, uh, you know, e even as far back as being like a little girl playing with dolls and everyone was, was you know, like, even when they were like, when I grow up, I'm going to marry one of the Partridge boys, you know what I mean? Or, and I was all like, not me, I'm going to fuck Dano from Hawaii Five O. Like, I was just out of the box, a different kind of I was, character. I, I was also that. You so know what I mean? I like, knew I, I didn't like shit. You, and I'm just saying, like, uh, uh, it's okay if you are living a different life than your uh, people around you. It's okay if your light bulb shines in a different fashion than the people uh, around you. It's okay if you get stuck and guilted into a situation. It's okay. Just try to extract yourself as classy as possible so that you can find out what's important to you. You know, sometimes you have to fail quite a bit to understand what your dream is. Who the fuck I, you are? I we don't even know who we are until we're 30-something. You I don't know who the fuck you are. never thought when I turned 18 years old and I flew back from Europe and had this guy pick me up who I didn't even recognize to go live with my handicapped mother and when I was getting kicked out and I would take the bus, you know, the once-a-day bus from Fountain, Colorado and go to Colorado Springs in Denver and try to get some kind of fucking normal job, I would have never thought to myself, Felicia, your path is going to be, you're going to show your titties, you're going to be in Playboy, you're going to do stand-up comedy, you're going to talk about your pussy, you're going to talk about women's rights within the realm of your pussy, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're going to adopt children, you're going to marry a TV producer, you're going to divorce a TV producer, you're going to go through the same shit your mother went through. And, and then do a podcast with an ex-felon And then do number a 67 podcast last week on iTunes. <laughs> with an ex-felon That's who, right, motherfucker. Who's a felon for uh, kidnapping charges, and you won't find out until you're on the podcast. That's <laughs> <laughs> Last night I went to a, to this lounge to do comedy. It's Skinny's. Right, Skinny's and Lounge. Great place to go, go do comedy. Cute place. Right? Great bar if you're oh, doing it's drugs. Really Tremendous. Yeah. Pleasing it's place. dark in there. They yeah. got these little things. You could mack on someone in the corner. And it's so weird how I've watched this comedian on stage and from far away. It's a female. She had glasses on and her hair. And she reminded me of Mitch Hedberg. And I hadn't oh, thought really? of Mitch in a long time. And it's so weird how, you know, we fuck around and we talk about drugs and all this shit and I'm one of those people that I'm not proud about what I did and I hate saying oh I've been clean for three years because in reality you're not supposed to fucking do them don't walk around patting yourself on the back just keep it to yourself and it's a, an accomplishment for you whatever the fuck it is right, you know right well but and, everyone has to go about it a yeah different in a different way, way. You know, everyone and has I'm, to figure out and I'm watching way. this and I remember like when Mitch died how mad I was how mad I was yeah. at him yeah. because listen man I don't people are gonna go come and go people die in car accidents people get shot Somebody gets caught fucking somebody's wife, you know, and it's exciting. But in this day and age, to die over fucking drugs, like an OD, has always got me. Even like uh, Geraldo yeah. a couple of weeks ago, yeah. broke my heart. It's yeah. not, it's not really, it's sad. It really is sad that, because it happened to my dad. Right. And it's so weird, like when you see it from another angle, like your life gets taken away over a fucking bump. And you don't know how many nights I used to, towards the end, I used to do the coke and look at myself in the mirror, and I could see my heart beating. Right. From the fucking in the mirror. Right. You can see your heart going ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And you're like, any minute I keep doing this, even though I'm walking a tightrope of death, it's a 50-50 shot. Yeah, but look how long you did it for. I mean, you were just extremely lucky. fucking lucky. lucky. Yeah, you just Because I walked a lot as a kid, and I drank a lot lucky. of water while I was doing blow. Yeah. You got to drink water to keep the system <laughs> afloat. You know no, Joey, we're just going to say you no, were no, lucky. No, no, <laughs> I'm very lucky, and that's why yeah. I have a second chance. I feel like every day, like, I don't do blow, and... I gotta do better, but it's so weird how uh, whenever I see that, it breaks my heart. When people no, come up, I don't yeah. mind if somebody smokes pot and drink, but it's not that big of a deal. Like, I was never really ahead as a kid. You would know that I was that much into blow if you'd seen me. Right. You know, because I was very, it, it takes you over. You become a cocoon. And that's what happened to Mitch at the end with the heroin. He didn't want anybody to see him. He wanted to alienate himself from everybody. Well, what a I'm, shame. What a fucking shame. It tragedy. is a tremendous shame because, uh, you know, he was, he was an uh, interesting person. I mean, uh, I didn't know Mitch super well, but I was around him a bit, and uh, I worked as an assistant director on his feature that he made called Los Enchiladas. And, uh, and you know, quite frankly, like you were saying how angry you are at Mitch, and it's like, you know, he just was a different dude. Like he had a, I think, uh, there was something where he just couldn't relate to people on an in 
on a personal level, and yet you wanted to be around him. And I just think, you know, he that's the way he chose to be able to even be around people. And it's sad because he added so much in such a short period of time. You know what it's I mean? Amazing. And it's weird because I went to Starbucks like a couple months ago, and uh, I saw, you know how they always have the chalkboard, and they always write like a really famous quote On from day, someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A quote, and it's always someone like, you know... Uh, you know, Mao Zedong or, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or some shit. <laughs> and they had a he- Hedberg quote on there. And I just thought, that is so strange that I, you know, that you know someone and that that's the mark they leave. And it's sad because he, he could have had so much more to give. It's amazing that we're going back into... The holiday season. I know it happens so quickly. It fucking kills me yeah. that we're back there, people. That's it. By the time you get this, a week and it's gonna go by, and you're gonna be sitting there with your grandma, or whoever the fuck you have, or yourself eating that piece of turkey, thinking about where the hell the year went. You know? Or you could come December eighth to our Beauty and the Beast live event at the Brea Improv. Tell them a little Would bit about that. Would you stop with that? I told you, <laughs> I'm not gonna drop that till after Thanksgiving. Oh. Man. Because okay. Thanksgiving is what's important right now. It's a time of the year. Okay. Where I never used to dig Thanksgiving. Then I really got the true meaning of it. You know, yeah. it's the beginning of everything. And it's so weird how we. Could, that's why when I came in today, I asked you, "Hey, what are you going to do for Thanksgiving?" Because I like to get all my shit in order because I don't want no drama. Right. Because it, and I, you hate committing going to people's houses. Like sometimes you go over. Oh yeah. And somebody always fucks something up. Oh, they do. Like they, they make, always you know, fuck like... something up. Wasabi mashed potatoes. Oh. Like, dude, it's Thanksgiving. It's I don't Thanksgiving, want wasabi bitch. mashed potatoes. I don't want any of your fucking home house improvement. They always, <laughs> I like my stove top right out of the box. Oh, you do? Yeah, I like prison stuffing. That's how yeah, I like yeah. it. I don't want no fucking, I don't want no celery in there. Yeah, I don't want any of your food for you. Yeah, I don't want none of that shit that they put in fucking all the time. Yeah. People want to be creative on Thanksgiving. When you have a stove top stuffing, it, it makes you feel like you're yeah. in the cocoon of your yeah. jail I want right? white meat. Right. I want mashed potatoes. I want stuffing. I want gravy on the side. And I want tons of cranberry juice, whether it's canned fruit I don't give a fuck right. on the side don't put that cranberry to hit my potatoes cause I will fucking stab you if I get red potatoes oh really yeah I hate when like beets oh. touch your shit I'll fucking stab you oh really oh I get listen yeah. Thanksgiving to me is emotional a couple of years ago I got invited to Thanksgiving I have this great friend Stacy Pokey right she's my fucking good friend I've known her for 12 years Houston Texas representing you know Stacy's one of those girls that talks like that <laughs> you know, that's awesome she's great I mean I love Stacy and every conversation we have by the end of the conversation, if there's a knife close by, I got to check it because I want to <laughs> stab her, but I love her so much. You know, Stacy's one of my sisters to the end. So it was her job to bring the mashed potatoes. We're right. going up to Pasadena, which I'm already pissed about. Right. So because yeah, you no, do not like to leave your house. No. And the party started at 7, which already I got to sit there all fucking day, smoke dope, and get hungry, and I can't eat. Right. You follow me? 7 o'clock. I want to eat Thanksgiving at 1 or 2. Yeah. And then at night, we do whatever we need to do. We eat mushrooms. We go to a comedy store, whatever. <laughs> So fucking 7 o'clock, I'm walking around like a, like a little African kid, starving. I'm, I get to this party, I'm fucking starving. So they start hitting us with surprises. First, it wasn't a turkey. It was going to be a tredunkin. A That's what? They take the turkey and they put a fucking uh, a, a bird in it. They put like some type of bird in your turkey. You never heard of that shit? They put a, a bird? A duck. They put a duck they in, put a duck they in a stick t- a duck turkey? in the turkey's ass and then they stuff it with Cajun food. This is this year. I'm sorry. So I'm livid already. That's I don't like not fucking correct. duck. I don't That's like not duck. Correct. No, I don't, no. So already I don't my need American values. So you, did you see the duck in the You see everything. Ass? The, yeah. the, and already Was they threw there something a curveball in the duck's ass? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Seafood. They yeah. put seafood in that. <laughs> no. Cajun seafood. That is just so No, wrong. this is wrong. My bo- my blood my blood pressure is boiling. There's kids running around. The kids people don't talking need to fucking see Spanish. Seafood in a duck's I'm losing ass. my fucking mind at this house. I'm losing my fucking mind already, right? Then Stacy shows up with these mashed potatoes. And I tasted the mashed Now listen, to me, the heart and soul is the turkey, but the fucking pinch hitter is the mashed potatoes. It's the ma- like you said, wasabi mashed potatoes. What the f- what fucking pilgrim had a jap over for fucking right. Thanksgiving? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? What fucking pilgrim? I looked at all the history books. So you said she comes up with these mashed potatoes that were worse than they were in a box. I remember tasting them. They were oh, garlic really? mashed potatoes. Guys, and I, this is no exaggeration, they were so bad. Now, this is all my uh-huh. little American Valley with my felonies and everything. Right. I'm breaking apart at the table. 
<laughs> Plus, she's got a boyfriend, Vinny, that will shut the fuck up. And he's got a half-retarded kid, like 16. They thought he was a rocker, the whole fucking deal. The kid was, he had glasses, like Jerry Lewis and the Nutty Professor. I wanted to stab them both. They were both driving me fucking crazy. This is her boyfriend at the time. Okay. And I, every, it's not her boyfriend anymore, no, no, is no, it? No, no, Okay, then him. you can talk about it. He was a big it. producer, and now he's in Tampa hiding from the government. He fucking, <laughs> so I'm eating these potatoes, and they're fucking horrible. Let me tell you how bad the potatoes were. I talked to Stacy three, four times a week. She's my heart and soul. I didn't talk to Stacy for five months. Oh, really? I grabbed my wife. I go, honey, we got to go home. I went to bed and I was crying. I'm not even kidding you because of how bad the food was. Potatoes? No, the stuffing was the, the stuffing had cherries in it. Another another fucking bitch with her good housekeeping recipe. Oh, Everybody who tries to be, right. just stick to the fucking pilgrim. They had a, a thing, a couple apples. Some, oh, then they had like pumpkin something else pie. Like everything was just weird, you know? Right. I went home. I just crawled up like a fucking bull. I crawled up like Chuck Liddell when he was getting... I crawled up like fucking Brock Lesnar when he was getting beat up by Cain Velasco. I just covered myself up in the embryo position. My wife made a turkey. This is how sweet she is. This is when I knew my wife loved me. While I was sleeping, crying, my wife made a turkey, mashed potatoes and stuffing, and we had... Shut the fuck up. We had turkey at 1.30 in the morning like Are normal people. Are you serious? I didn't talk to Stacy for five months. Right, your wife did that for you? Yep, because she knew how, wow. how much of a value... That meal is. That meal is not about turkey and coming over. In my youth, I would go to people's houses and eat the stuffing and get high and how many beers can you drink. It's something that you sit down and you look at your family and you go, look at these ugly motherfuckers I got in my family. You look at your life, you know? Right. And you look at who you're with and your friends. It's such a good day. But they turned it into a Hollywood turkey fucking right. fest. Everybody yeah, had to be they, different. I don't agree with the, with the duck of a turkey. Oh, fest. I was living. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't talk. I remember Stacy calling me saying, what's the matter? Are you mad at me? And like, I couldn't tell her. Were its little legs sticking out? It was just horrible. <laughs> my mom my mom always said, my mom always said never to fucking put down a woman's cooking. Yeah. So I just left her at that. But she agitated me so much. Like, why are you mad at me? Why are you mad at me? Is this something I said? Oh, she did. Oh, yeah. Finally, one oh, day I said, because that fucking mashed potatoes, they were so horrible. She was like, why? Well, I go, don't worry about Vinny. Don't worry about the business. All you got to worry about is getting a new fucking mashed potato recipe. Like, I was livid after six months. Oh, really? And she's like, what are you talking about? I go, those mashed potatoes on Thanksgiving, they were the worst fucking thing I ever tasted. She goes, well, everybody else seemed to like them. I go, yeah, before they all shit blood for fucking three <laughs> days after that. I go, she goes, they were great. I go, yeah, if you were going to use them as spackle. I mean, they were drying right on the dish. Right. Like, if you turned them oh. over, they wouldn't. It was horrible. I mean, I was living at her. And to this day, every time people say, bring food over, I always call and say, Stacy, you bring those mashed potatoes <laughs> over, I'll fucking stab you. My mashed potatoes are good. <laughs> Fuck you, bitch. <laughs> Don't be bringing those nasty-ass fucking potatoes to my house, motherfucker. When I was a kid, I used to go to the Holloway's house. And the mother was German, or either or. The father was Irish, and the mother was German. And this was one of the most interesting houses that when I grew up as a kid. Oh, yeah. And they were really cool, and they would make sauerkraut, and they, they would always invite me. And the father was a bookie in Hoboken and a longshoreman. He got us our first book in the Longshoreman's Union. And then uh, whatever went out of business, and we still collected $144 a day to have a no-show job. This is thanks oh, to his right, family. Oh, right, right. And they were Irish and German. They'd always be drinking, and they would never let us drink in the house. Like, they were very respectful to that, but they cursed, and they fucking went nuts. So one day I'm over there, we're eating sour brown, and I'm over there, they lived in Jersey City Heights. This is uh, probably March of 82. Every fucking weekend, Roger, the little kid, would come home and go, Coco, last night we had fireworks down there because Jersey City Heights was in the border of Jersey City and North Bergen, uh -huh. and people stray up there like crazy people. So we're sitting there one day eating this sour brown, fucking delicious. They used to marinate it in the vinegar with these red potatoes, and it gets red red cabbage. Oh, right. yeah, my yeah. God. Yeah, and they, yeah. It's just amazing. Just fucking amazing, you know? And we're down there eating all of a sudden, boom, 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 at dinner time. Like you heard a gun go off. I'll never right. forget this. We're at the table, and we're all eating. And everybody pops their head up, but Mr. Holloway's still fucking eating. Oh, know? yeah. And all of a sudden, you hear, boom, one more gunshot. And all of a sudden, little Roger's like, Dad, somebody got shot. And without saying a word, he goes, mind your fucking business. And he just... <laughs> <laughs> and he yeah, just kept eating. Say, yeah. We're sitting there eating the sour brown. And all of a sudden he goes, Dad, I got to look. Roger, mind your fucking business. Sit down. If he got shot, maybe he deserved it. You don't know what the fuck's going on. I swear to God, Roger couldn't take it. And we finally got up and opened up the curtain. The guy was 50 feet from us in the street, bleeding from his shirt. And he's like, oh. dial 911. And Roger's like, the old man's like, Roger, sit down. You touch that phone, I'll put shoot you and put you out there. Mind your fucking business. Let him die. I mean, that was the German and this guy. Finally, the ambulance came. They took him. 
but he wouldn't let us, because he was an old school booker. He knew you call up, people are going to ask you questions. This motherfucker was out there for 15 minutes wow. holding on. And oh, we're like wow. sitting there going, Roger, Mr. Holloway, sit down. You, the Cuban kid, sit down, mind your fucking business, wow. eat your sour brown. It was Every time we went down there, his grandmother would squish cans of beer with her hands. Oh, yeah. Like just go, Foo, and she had a hump. And right. Roger had a little nose that was crooked, so she's called him Hook Face. <laughs> Hook Face, get me a beer. <laughs> That was a grandma, though. Wow, that's and, a tough old bird. And the father had an ice cream box, you know, the old Briars boxes? Uh -huh. He had those in the freezer filled with money. Really? So Roger would go, Coco, when you come over, take my dad in the kitchen, in the bathroom, hold him there. <laughs> <laughs> hold him there, right? Don't right. worry about nothing. So we would all come over and take Roger's dad. Show us your guns from World War II. Come on, let's go in the bedroom. we look at Roger. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Roger be in the kitchen and Roger could never add. So we get in the car. Roger, what'd you get him for? I got him for 60 and I got 60 from my mom. That's 180. No, Roger, it's 120, <laughs> you fuck. <laughs> that is so funny. We had some good times. Oh, we were I at bet. his house one time with this girl, Gabby. And Gabby was like the neighborhood freak. You could be walking on Kennedy Boulevard. Gabby would fly by. You go, Gabby, what, are you busy? Can you suck my dick? Sure. She'd suck your dick. Oh, really? And she was sucking the dick of one of the principals at the school. It was hysterical. She, How she, old was she when she was doing she that? She was probably 17, 16. Oh, really? And she was blowing Ray Dalton. God bless us all. One of the best principals I ever had. Oh, my God. One of the best principals I ever had. Are you sure? Oh, he's dead as disco, but he right. was one of the best principals. Really? The cops came looking for me in high school. He, he fucking wouldn't bust. He wouldn't bust. He kept switching the oh, name. Coco really? who? I don't know no Coco Diaz. Oh, really? And he called one of my buddies. I went up to his bar and he yeah. fucking, well, he, he brought me. You don't me think he was that way because he had a 17 year old stuck in his no, dick? No, Ray Dalton was a straight, Ray around? Dalton was a straight really? G from the old school. Ray really? Dalton got me, uh, he kept me in school twice from getting thrown out for drinking in school. One time we robbed a beer case, a beer truck, and we brought the beers to school. They, they were there, they were really evictus. Anyway, <laughs> one day, fucking, uh, I, I get a call from, Roger, and he's like, you got to come down here. We're doing blow. Gabby's here sucking everybody's dick. This is 1984. Right. We had already gotten out of high school. Gabby's still sucking dick. And she had a body that was... Was she good at it? I, I only got a blowjob from her one time in the car while she was driving. Brilliant. And she... <laughs> listen to, listen to she how... She was driving and giving... Listen, listen to me how strong this girl was. I was walking in the winter one time. All I needed was a ride. Like, I was just walking, waiting for the bus. And she pulled over and goes, what are you doing? You need a ride? Yeah. Get in. I'll suck your dick. She said it. Not even me. I sat there... She was giving me a hand job while we're driving, like it was nothing. Yeah. And then she just pulled the car, but she didn't even park. She pulled it in like a Puerto Rican parks in front of his house, like sideways. Yeah. And sucked my dick. Cars were going around this while she was sucking my dick. This is the pro she was. <laughs> she was the real deal. But years later, I never seen her again. That's why when he called me and said, Gabby's down here sucking dick, I was like, she's still sucking dick? That's a long <laughs> time, you know? She's been sucking dick since I was a kid, you know? <laughs> We go down to his house. It's a oh, Sunday no. afternoon. There's nine guys down there. Everybody's oh, whacked no. out of their mind on coke. Supposedly, he was eating her pussy, right? Raw. No condom on his tongue. No towel oh, around his face. No. Just eating her monkey. And he got up to go to the bathroom. And some other guy came in and started fucking her. Oh, so he comes no. back, right? No, and no. And he's fucking her. He's like, Gabby, what happened? I was just about ready to do my shit. And he goes, and she's like, hey, you took too long. And he goes, you know what, Gabby? You're a fucking pig. And she goes, I'm a pig. You ate my pussy. I spat. <laughs> <laughs> Without even double thinking. Without even taking a breath. She said that. Oh, we lost it. Awesome. And she turned to, to whoever she was fucking, Stephen Edwards, and she just kept banging him like nothing. I'm so sick of texting right now. You know what I mean? Do you get a lot of texts? I do not answer them. Really? I do not answer like texts unless it's got it. something to do with yeah. cash. Yeah. Because and I and I tell people like people come up to me and go, "Hey, you didn't get my text. You didn't answer me." I, I don't get texts. I bring people to my playing field. Right. I don't want to play on people's playing field unless you're texting me with money or a picture or something or something. Right. I get pictures of pussy. People send me, you know, my friend Eddie fucks a chick and he'll yeah. take a picture of her pussy and send and you it to don't me. Look at it? Do you look I don't want to see that shit. Yeah. I really don't. Really? You know, I don't. I may believe, like, I don't applaud it. I don't want pictures yeah. on my phone. I don't right. want text messages on my phone. Well, I just get so sick of it. Like, oh, geez. You know, and people like, want to talk on that. You there. know, I'm, it's getting to the point where everyone's texting that when I talk to people on the phone, I can't talk to them uh, in a, a pattern. You know what I mean? Because I don't talk to people a lot on the phone anymore. It's texting. So I'm so sick of texting. And first of all, I started started texting the only reason i started texting is so i could sext with an activity partner that's what you need you need you to have your mean? fingers and yeah. press what the fuck so just now, get on the phone and say i want to suck your dick no no What's so i like the sexting that? though i like the sexting but here's the thing when i did the sexting because that's how i learned how to text you know now like when i get a text 
you know, I have like, I'm like Pavlov's dog, you know, my little monkey, you know, gives a little shimmer, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, you know, it's not right. People send me a text. It's like, you want to meet for coffee? Hot damn, I want to meet for some fucking coffee. Yeah. Tell me you'll sip your coffee gently and slowly, baby. <laughs> gently and slowly. Now pull my hair and chug that coffee. Mmm, can you feel the Arabica beans hitting the back of my throat? Mm -mm. You said I gotta mm. deal with people. You said I gotta fucking deal with them in the morning. Well, you know, my teacher always told me, Joey, What's that? <clears throat> when you hear a clit ring, an angel gets his wings. <laughs> oh, shit. Some knowledge for you there in Podcastville. You know what I'm saying? There you go. And by the way, since we're on the subject, uh, let's give a little bit of uh, a shout out to our sponsors AdamandEve.com, the best, always. Tell them the deal. For all your sexual and erotic. And fantasial needs, you know what I'm saying? That's right. If you want to put whatever up your little muffler, up your penis, they even have a tube you put on your penis. It's like the old straws that has a propeller in the front, so you can play <laughs> Captain Marvel in your house. You know what I'm saying? That's what Adam and Eve does. And yeah. right now, special at the bottom of the box, you press an F E L I C I A. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. F E L I C I A, bitches. All right, I can't look you in the eye because right now. <laughs> look me in the eye, dirty bitch. <laughs> You get 50% off your order. You get three free movies. You get a special gift that's tremendous. And ready for this one, you get free shipping. So after you listen to the podcast, get on adamandeve.com and do what the fuck you got to do. Let me tell you something. One thing about the podcast listeners is we get a lot of great emails. And our podcast listeners are into fucking music. And they always bust my balls about talking more about music. So... Last Thursday, I got this. Uh, I was in Austin, Texas, and uh -huh. I got this email about that. I can't see without my fucking glasses at night. And it was an email of an arena, like a, a concert. And I'm looking at this thing, and I'm like, what the fuck? And then I get a call from my buddy. Now, I'm in Texas. It's 11 o'clock, and he's calling me. I know this guy's an engineer, and I know that it's 1 in the morning in Jersey. This guy's using it up, so maybe my I, I, di I pocket dialed it. Uh -huh. So I, I was like, I went to look at the phone again an hour later, and he called back. So I'm like, this motherfucker and me are on. So I call him up. Uh, the kid's name is Steve Avillo, great friend of mine. I've known him since I was 13. And he goes, Coco, where are you? He goes, I can't talk. I'm just getting out of the Meadowlands. And uh, he goes, can I call you back? And I go, yeah. And all of a sudden, one in the morning. I mean, this kid's got a kid, two kids in college. And Steven was one of my best friends growing up, and he stopped partying. You know, he drinks right. still, but he, he's in a band now. He plays a guitar. But he's a real guitar head, this kid. He had, a, he had something like what you have back here when we were growing up. And this was our party. He had a room. fancy garage. He had a fancy garage that he turned into. <laughs> we called it the shed. Right. And he turned it into a party place. There was a set of drums in there. There was a guitar. So he'd come in at any time and play. But this kid's such a great artist that the four walls, the one wall uh, north is Pink Floyd the wall. Uh -huh. He did it by hand. Beautiful. The wall with all the markings. Oh, really? The other wall was uh, the Kinks Sleepwalker. The other oh, wall really? was... Uh, Black Sabbath, Volume 4, Ozzy Osbourne, a tremendous album. He's got his hands up with the fucking ruffles, and this is Volume 4, tremendous. And the other had like a mixture of shit. I think it had like a Led Zeppelin or something like that on it. But him and I went to see The Wall 30 years ago, and it was mind-blowing. I have a YouTube clip on it where I tell the story. We got the tickets for $15.50. The album came out, and the tickets went on sale. It was November of 80 and, and uh, 79, and wow. it was right after my mom died, and right. this was like the big thing. The wall was released, and we would smoke. We would buy $25 worth of weed, roll 35 joints, and we'd go in the shed and listen to the wall from beginning to end. And then one day he calls me, because we got to play hooky. The wall tickets are on sale. And we got this guy to drive us that he thought he was Satan while we were growing up. Uh -huh. His name was Joe Satan Focaraccio. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and he used to call himself Satan. And he was very Italian, like the mother would sit you down. Right, Satan should eat, be Italian. Eat and then all this Why stuff. Not? And we'd yeah. go to his house, and the house was gorgeous, but his bedroom was black. Oh, and it really? had a noose in it because he thought he was the devil. He it had like a noose? A, a noose in it. I don't know where he got I thought about so it. So his for, bedroom was black with a noose with in a it. With a noose in it. It had Satan LaFolk. On the thing, that's what he called himself. And for Halloween, he dressed up like Satan. Oh, really? It was fucking classic, you know. So he's the driver, and I'm like, oh, Bill, Satan's the driver. Oh, do you really want to do this? You know, and we're like, yeah, don't worry, Bill. Uh, he's cool, you know. He's cool, you know. If we get him high, he won't even talk about the devil or nothing. So on the way there, he hits a fuck. <laughs> we're 14, 15. Right. On the way there, he hits a barrel on the, on the interstate. I mean, we're howling because the joint fell on his shirt. It's like the typical story. Right. And he's you know going like this, and yeah. also he hits a barrel. Because Satan air. apparently burns. Right, so. <laughs> As afraid of fire. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Felicia cracking funny. 
so uh, we go to this one place, and they don't have the tickets, so we ended up going to St. Peter's College, and we got tickets for $15.50 oh, really? to the wall. So we were fired up about this. The concert was February 20th, 1980. It's November of 79. So every day to that concert, we listen to The Wall, Animals, Dark Side of the Moon, fucking, uh, you know, sh Shine On You, Wish You Were Here. These are masterpieces of American music. Which a lot, and they put four out, at, one after the other, gentlemen. They put out, I don't know the exact discography, but they put out Animals, Dark Side right. of the Moon, which is number one selling album of all time, The Wall, and somewhere in there was Wish You Were Here. Four fucking masterpieces. Right. We're tripping on acid every day. I'm selling mescaline. I'm getting from East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania on the weekends. With Nick Biamonte, I would get 100 hits for $90 and sell them for, for the dollars. Amish were making that acid? Uh, some <laughs> East Stroudsburg State <laughs> College, a bunch of... Really? They had these fucking hippies that had white beards already from taking all the acid. And every week, they'd make something new for us. Four-way acid, blotter acid, really? window pane acid. We'd get ups. I'd buy 1,000 Black Beauties for $35. $5, and I would sell them to the wrestlers for 100 for $35. I had a tremendous <laughs> business going. I'm telling you, I was popping ups every day. I was losing my fucking mind. I was a lost kid. Right. But I still remember that Sunday. Like it was a Sunday night, Pink Floyd, Nassau Coliseum. We met at 11 o'clock and we did it right. We drank a couple beers and we dropped a half a hit of acid. But it just so happened my friend Le 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 Lebrano, his mother was going <laughs> to drive us. The stutterer. The stutterer, but his mother had to go to bingo or something. So again, the guy that did the heroin in his grandmother's apartment. No, that's George E. K. Oh, okay. This okay. is this is Le 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 Lebrano, the okay. stutterer. So he's supposed to drive, and his mother has to go to bingo, get her hair done. So now Joe LaFolk, Satan's going to drive us to fucking right. Nassau Coliseum, February 20th in the snow. So we go out there, we, we, we get the tickets, they're phenomenal tickets, they're the level up, so we see the stage, and all of a sudden, I don't know if you've listened to The Wall, there's two albums, there's side one and two, and then there's uh -huh. a break in side three and four. In between side three and four, we're cooking on the acid. I mean, we're fucking cooking. People are getting <laughs> up and talking, we're sitting in our chairs. <laughs> if you could see how Joey just sat oh in his chair God, like, Oh my God, we were just like, sitting there. I'm, I must contain, I must contain, I mean, I this must fucking contain. acid was killing us. I'm seeing fucking pigs. And, you know, and if you ever know anything about the wall, it's these four guys performing. But at one point in the concert, they start building a wall in front of them. Right. And all of a sudden, while they're playing, this wall gets built. And by the end of the show, they knock the wall down. But while all this is going on, they got pigs and shit flying. And they got a video thing going on, which your head's about to fucking <laughs> oh, explode. Absolutely. I'm and sure. what a lot of people don't know about the wall was at the dark side of the moon, uh, they were touring. Uh, and, 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 and they were in Toronto, or one of those Canadian places. And while they were on stage, Roger Waters is such an intellectual that he felt that his audience was very stupid. He, and he spit at one of the audience members, <laughs> really? and he went back, and he told the audience, David Gilmore, he told him, he goes, you know what, I wish I could perform behind the fucking wall. That's where that concept came oh, from. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. and he did a wall about growing up in East Berlin during World War II with Hitler. That's what the wall's about. Right. It's a fucking phenomenal masterpiece that if you, if you haven't, you know, people talk about psychedelics. You eat a fucking mushroom, you turn the lights off, and you put the wall on from beginning to end, your life will fucking change. Oh, wow. We go to this concert... The balloons at halftime, as I call it, they throw out a million fucking balloons. Everybody's walking and mingling with one another. Folk is sitting there with a lighter burning all the balloons as they land. <laughs> bah! Bah! That's bah! Satan. Satan. Sa <laughs> and all of a sudden, there's these four little young cocksuckers that didn't even know why they were there. They just thought, Pink Floyd, let's go. And they went to the show. They, were, they had to be from Long Island. They were rich and shit. And they're behind us. And one of them finally reaches over. And she goes, excuse me. She goes, why do you keep burning the balloons? And he looks at her with a quick look. And he goes, Satan does not like balloons. <laughs> and they left. Oh, yeah. The girls yeah. left. They never came back. That's how much he scared them. They were like, we got to get away from that balloon killer. So this is He's 30 crazy. years later. Gilmore leaves, you know, Pink Floyd's in disarray. Because we, we did watch the documentary. At we your did, house. at my house. What was the name of that documentary? That was a biography on A&E, or one of those. It was, yeah. a, it, was a sports, it was a music biography. But the real thing is that all of a sudden, this I'm in Austin, and I haven't thought about this story, and it's a villa. And he, I go, what's up, Avilos? And he goes, Are you, can you talk? And I'm thinking like somebody died. And he goes, bro, I just went to the Meadowlands to see Roger Waters at the Pink Floyd. Oh, yeah. He goes, I got a ticket at the gate for a buck and a quarter. And he goes, I got to tell you, there was nobody there. Really? And he goes, guess who I went with? And I go, who? And he goes, I went with Joe Focaraccio <laughs> and L L Loops. He goes, I called them up and everybody went. So I was the only thing missing from this oh, night. Right. And he broke it down. I could feel the passion in his voice. He's like, Joey fucking, he calls me Cokes. He goes, Cokes, fucking uh, David Gilmore wasn't there, but they had to get three guitarists to fill his void. That's how strong wow. David Gilmore is. David Gilmore is a bad motherfucker. Everybody talks about this guy and Randy Rhodes. You put on animals and you check back with me. David Gilmore is a fucking powerhouse. 
and the, the lead and comfortably numb. Let me tell you something. When you're on that acid and you hear that guitar, you can feel his right. love. When you hear the guitar leads on animals, because uh, animals is about the world. It's about four different types of people. Sheep, dogs, uh, dogs, sheep. She, Joe, you're tearing pigs. up. Pigs. Oh, yeah, because up. people don't understand the importance. So which, of, which one are you? I'm a fucking dog. Yeah. you got to be crazy. you got to have a real name. Which need. one am I? You're a dog. Okay. You're a dog. <laughs> you better not call me a pig. <laughs> there's sheeps and then there's fucking pigs, right. you know, and, and the pigs are the politicians and the oh, people okay. like that. That's what they refer to. Pink Floyd never released a picture on any of their albums to make it even deeper. You didn't even know who the Pink Floyd was. You don't know if that's a guy's name. But we were talking outside, and he was saying that how amazing it was. And I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, I would give an arm to be there with you. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, did you trip? And he goes, Cokes, I had a mushroom in my pocket, but I'll be honest with you, if I would have ate it, I would have ran out of there. Because <laughs> the visuals, I can't even imagine yeah. now, 30 years later. Oh, they if, must be, if, yeah. if, if, I would love to go see that. He said it was amazing. Yeah. So people always talk about, you know, they email me, and they send me music, and I love it. You know, this week it's Pink Floyd, bitches. Because it's 30 years later, the story yeah. is amazing, you know, and the rumor, the word on the street is that Gilmore's going to play with them in L.A. And they're really? in L.A. twice, and, oh, and I really? can't afford to go. I mean, I'm trying. Because the tickets are how much? Well, the tickets on paper, like 450 250 oh, yeah. but <clears throat> the day of is something different. The oh, day of is true. something yeah. different. So what I'm thinking of doing when I leave here, I'm going to call my buddy. I'm going to tell him to put an order in for an eighth of mushrooms. It's 25 bucks, and I'm just going to have them, and we're going to see what happens on that day. I think it's like November 30th. And then there again at the Staples thing in December something. Even if, and I'm thinking of going by myself. Like that's the only really? way to experience. Yeah, I want a trip. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go take with the you. train. I'm gonna take the train. Go. I think we should go. So I yeah, got Terry I'll on go. it. But again, they told Terry. They said since the tickets are so expensive, yeah. let's wait. We gotta wait till the day of. Okay. And if we release some tickets, let me tell you something. There's nothing in my world that I want to do more than that. I love. Uh, Pink you Floyd. should go with your wife. Yeah. No, my okay. wife don't like. My wife's not gonna understand it. You understand what I'm trying to say to you? Pink Floyd is not something that you go to as a hobbyist. You got to right. be in the fucking moment. I don't want you there. You're wasting my fucking time. You know, these people <laughs> go to concerts and they buy the album that's out an hour. And then, again, then they go and then when they don't know the music, they stand around and look at me. I don't know what the fuck to tell you. Yeah. This is why you got to be prepared like that bookie in fucking Rocky. Right. Rocky told them, <laughs> you got to plan ahead, bitch. This is Pink Floyd. I want you to listen to all four albums. I want you to listen to Piper at the Gates of Dawn. I want you to understand where these motherfuckers are coming from. You know, what people don't understand is that they had a guy that, that, that snapped from doing too much acid. The guy's name was oh, Sid, Sid Barrett. Sid Barrett. Sid yeah, Barrett. I knew about that part. Yeah, and it's a very sweet story. You know, wish you were here. Sto story, shine right? on you crazy diamond. These are four fucking guys that wrote music about their fallen friend. Shine on you crazy diamond. How fucking beautiful is that to say to somebody? Yeah. Not good morning. Hey, bitch, shine on you crazy motherfucking <laughs> diamond. You know That's a beautiful oh, thing. Oh, Joe, uh, you're... Wish you were tissue, here. You're, you're tearing up When again. was the last time you heard wish you were here? I know, wish you were here. That you didn't think amazing. about somebody yeah. from your yeah. life. Because yeah. it's so deep. Yeah. It's like uh, playing that for somebody at their funeral. Yeah. So if you get a chance this week, go on iTunes, download Animals, download Dark Side of the Moon, download Wish You Were Here, and then download uh, The Wall and Bitches Get Back to Me. Please email us, by the way, at beautyandthebeastpodcast at gmail.com. You can also email us through our website, which is brand spanking new at beautyandthebeast.com. Or you can leave a comment on the comment board. The comments have been uh, very interesting. Some Someone called you a fat fuck and me a cocksucker. Perfect. And, that means uh, we'll get and through. then someone else said, Dude, that's just not right. And then I was all like, well, you are a fat fuck and I am a fuck cocksucker. Fuck yeah. <laughs> you ain't lying. Hey, listen. That's the key word here. Optimistic and he ain't lying. Yeah, yeah. That's our new code. It's we ain't lying. It's only offensive if I'm the fat fuck and you're the cocksucker. That's right. <laughs> I love you guys. Beauty and the Beast. Have huh? a great week. We love you. Uh-huh. Stay black. Okay. Hit him with a kiss, baby. Mwah. Mwah. Love you. Bye. Bye.